Thank you, John. You know how to make a girl blush. Um, <laughs> it's great to see you all here, and so many of you have come from so far, including from Brighton, Swansea, uh, Huddersfield, or someplace up north like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, when I was offered the job here at UCL a year ago, I was also I heard that I'd been uh, awarded a Dream Fellowship and the Dream Fellowship was awarded from the EPSRC to a few people who they thought could go and think out of the box and have a vision 
as part of that requirement, um, I had to go and travel extensively. So no sooner had I arrived at UCL, I was off to South Africa, um, Cape Town, much to the chagrin of my colleagues, but they managed very well without me. Um, when I was in Cape Town, I did lots of things, but just towards the end of my uh, trip there, I was invited by the user experience group to give a talk um, in downtown Cape Town. So I hadn't heard of the place so I, I didn't have sat nav in my car, so I memorized it on the map. And unfortunately, the people I was going to go with couldn't make it. And so I drove down. I don't know if any of you have driven around Cape Town. It's fairly straightforward, except I'm hopeless, and I got terribly lost. And I just parked my car, and then I asked lots of people how to get to this building, and no one knew. And eventually, I found my way there, and I was completely flustered. And I arrived and I couldn't find the person who'd invited me. And then eventually this woman said, are you Yvonne Rogers? And I said, yes. She said, I'm terribly sorry, but your host has had to uh, go back to England because his mother's died suddenly. And so she said, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to host you. I said, no, no, that's fine. So she took me into this uh, room and it was an old bank that had been converted into a restaurant trendy bar. But at the back there was a room. And so I really always have a thing about wires and getting the sound working. Anyway, we couldn't even find where the wires were and where the data projector was, so it took lots and lots of time, and I was getting really, really flustered. And um, they, the audience started to arrive, but instead of coming into the room, they were having a glass of wine in the restaurant. And so I thought, I just wanted to sink into the ground at this moment. So instead, I looked up to the ceiling, and this is what I saw in this bank. <laughs> this is a life-size wax model of uh, uh, Desmond Tutu flying from a chandelier. <laughs> and I just couldn't believe it. I just looked up and I thought, wow. So I walked up and sure enough, <laughs> there was Desmond Tutu, lifelike, with cross hanging down. And it just made my day. I stopped panicking and I enjoyed the talk from then on. So I, was, I thought, well, I wonder what lecture theatre they're going to give me. <laughs> And sure enough, in Roberts Building, there aren't many. So what we have here is just a nice white ceiling. But instead, what I thought, because of the title of my talk, Rafi, we are going to give you a piece of fudge each. And uh, So if you'd like to take a piece of fudge, it will help focus and concentrate the mind. Thank you very much. I hope there's enough pieces there. They're all out of it. Okay. So my uh, down to business. My lecture is looking at behavioural change, and this is an area of research I've been working in for the last uh, few years. And um, we've been looking at how we can design technologies to change various behaviours. And it's not just us that have been looking at it, but there have been lots of other people, marketing people, advertising people, behavioural psychologists, and the government have also got very interested in using different techniques to make people do things and change their behaviour so they um, obey the law and so on. I think one of the first innovative uses of technology um, or um, ways of thinking about behavioural change was by a couple of years ago um, by VW. And they suggested, or they put out a competition um, to try and get people to think about fun ways in which you could get people to change their behaviour. And this, um, they asked people to submit um, videos. And this one, uh, I think, uh, speaks for itself. <coughs>
So why do we need any theory when fun can do it all? But I'll come to that later. So that was, I think, one of the uh, innovative approaches to trying to get people to change their behavior, to take uh, the stairs rather than the escalator. There have been lots of others and other... Um, um, factors that people have used. One has been uh, the use of LEDs or light to try and encourage people to do things differently. The one on the left is called the Reflect Table and this is some research that was done by uh, um, Khaled Bakur who uh, worked with us as well a couple of years ago where what he was trying to do was to try and um, encourage more equitable participation in uh, meetings. You know when you go to a meeting someone always talks forever and some people never say anything. And so he thought that he, if you could make explicit, which is what is normally implicit, people might stop talking so much or encourage them to talk more. So you can see here the lady in the uh, <coughs> right-hand corner, she's got the purple LEDs, and as the meeting progresses, she speaks more and more and more. And I'm sure you all know that person. And the person um, uh, down the bottom there has, has spoken the less with the yellow lights. And um, he carried out some studies to see whether or not this was the case. And he found that uh, while some people uh, did take um, heed, some people just completely ignored the LEDs, thinking, well, it doesn't matter that someone's speaking much more than someone else, because the one person who speaks a little may actually have that <coughs> one uh, important thing to say. Others, meanwhile, treated it like a video game, and they're trying to compete with each other as to how many LEDs. Um, the one on the right is uh, the power aware cord, which shows how much electricity um, is being used by pulsating. Um, and so the more, uh, the more it pulsates. So it's showing you something um, that you wouldn't otherwise have. As well as um, lights, colour has <coughs> been used to try and um, convey uh, information and change behaviour. So on the left is the ambient orb, which shows uh, um, electricity consumption. Um, and it, it changes depending on how much. So if it's this nice purple hue that suggests that there's not much um, that's being used at that time, but it could change to, to red, and that might get someone, which is a lot more, might get them thinking about how they might, you know, perhaps they should change the behavior to get it back to the purple. The gadget on the right was developed um, by some uh, colleagues, I think, in Sussex, if I'm correct. Um, it's called What's On, no pun intended there, but it shows on the top how much, if you uh, plug this into the um, appliance, be a kettle or a light, it would cost you if it was on for the whole year. So in this one, it would be £1,491. And that gets people thinking about things differently. We can also use lures to help to um, lure people to do something uh, that they may not otherwise think of. And this is a project I did at the Open University with, with colleagues where we tried to lure people um, to take the stairs rather than the lift. And we put twinkly lights in the carpet. And as they came in to um, the building, they had the choice either to, to take the stairs or the lift. And most people tend to go towards the lift. And we thought that we had these twinkly lights that might lure them. And indeed it did. If they, if they deviated and went off towards the lift, um, red lights would start to come up, suggesting it was angry with you, <laughs> as you can see on the right there. We can also think about how we might use size um, as a, a way. And in this, this is a project that was carried out by, it's called Green Cloud um, in Helsinki by Helen Evans and Hekio um, Hansen. And what they did was use a laser um, to draw a glowing cloud that's coming out um, to represent smoke from a power plant. And the bigger the cloud, the more power that's being used in the city. Another approach is to use approval. And here again is the, uh, the orb, but it's being used differently. And it's, it was designed by uh, James Gardner and Chris Adams um, as a tea light. And what, um, what it does is it approves of you to make a cup of tea or not by um, uh, polling the, the, um, the, the national power grid. And so um, if everyone is watching the X Factor, for example, it would be bright red. So, um, no, it would be green because they're watching the X Factor. Um, but as soon as that ends, it might go red, suggesting that the national power supply um, is being exceeded. So it's telling you when it's a good time to make a cup of tea or not. Another approach is to use anticipation. Anyone use this site? It's called canituronit.com. Uh, well, what it does is it tells you, again, how much um, uh, um, pressure there is on the national grid. And if it's, uh, um, 
uh, over, um, if it's exceeding it, it's suggesting again that you shouldn't um, make yourself a cup of tea. So if I type this in and see what happens, it'll tell you uh, what the current, um, uh, that the grid is under strain, so it's suggesting to you not to. But you might wait a couple of hours and you think, I wonder if it's okay to do it now. And it'll say yes. So that's a website that's available um, to give you that. Another approach is to use humor. This is uh, using magical mirrors, uh, distortion mirrors rather, where um, it shows the girl what would happen if she takes the lift versus if she took the stairs. So <laughs> uh, it doesn't need any explanation um, and it appeals to certain people that kind of humor and not to others. Then there are uh, those who go for the emotive approach which is um, very much in your face. So when I was in downtown LA a couple of years ago, I noticed this and it says elevators are for wimps and it's trying to encourage you to climb these very large uh, high-rise buildings. I didn't see anyone read them or take any notice. It might be a, a case of um, what my colleague Paul Marshall has been looking into, display blindness. But it's very much playing on people's weaknesses and guilt. So they're just some examples of ways in which you might uh, think about um, designing um, technologies or signage to try and encourage or people to do things or change their behavior. So in terms of our research, we've been thinking about, well, which technologies might we use? There are a whole range of them, as I showed, but not, um, there's also different kinds of, of um, technology, technology devices like persuasive technology, ambient displays, and mobile apps. And that's been part of uh, our research agenda. But also we've been looking at what techniques we might um, implement, and I'll come back to this later. Uh, do we use uh, based on um, social norms coming from uh, psychological research or information salience or priming? Um, some people say, well, rather than this kind of bottom-up approach, why not just um, uh, take a top-down approach, uh, which is what the government has done in, in previous years, which is to set targets and limits and campaigns for particular behaviours that they um, desire in, in, in society. And the idea here is that you use the law to enforce those targets. So one, for example, is that the average CO2 emissions from new cars has to be 120 grams per uh, kilometre by 2012. I don't know whether that was actually um, uh, set in law, but that was, uh, that's an example. And um, we're not saying that one way or another is, is appropriate, but there is one of the, the, the discussions that, that's been had is, is do you impose or do you try and encourage people to change their behavior, not necessarily against their will? And in terms of our research, we've been very much, uh, I think there's lots of theory out there to try and ground it on um, behavioral change in social psychology and behavioral economics. And I'm not going to go into detail to all of these theories, but just the two that have, that have been, we've used um, and it's influenced our thinking about how to couch um, uh, this research and, and what kinds of designs. And the first one is, um, a simple heuristics that make us smart. This is by Gert Gigerenza and Peter Todd, one of my colleagues at the um, Indiana University and the ABC group at the Max Planck Institute. And um, their idea is that, um, that we make decisions using fast and frugal um, heuristics and that the, sometimes the best decisions are those that are made rapidly, uh, that that, aren't, uh, that are based on shortcuts and that we tend to ignore information. So let me give you an example. Um, if I ask you which city has the biggest po population, Dortmund or Bielefeld? How many of you would say Dortmund? How many of you say Bielefeld? None, okay. And how did you come to that decision? Well, according to their theory, typically you would uh, um, think about one salient piece of information which would be is it a capital city? Dortmund isn't and Bielefeld isn't either. And then you might come to another um, uh, uh, question um, and you'd say something like does it have a football team in the Bundesliga? Any of you know anything about German football? Or know that Dortmund um, does but Bielefeld doesn't. And at that point you would stop your search. Um, so it's a limited search strategy uh, where you're, you, know, you don't need to then go on an exhaustive search to decide um, which of those has the biggest population. 
For those of you who would like to know, Dortmund has um, 580,000, of which three of them are my cousins. <laughs> And Bielefeld has 323,000. Okay, so um, the other um, uh, ideas that we've been looking at um, are from Thaler and Sunstein's book, Nudge. Any book that says hot stuff on it is, is you know, a good read, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but it's very much a... Um, it's been a, po a popular science book, and I don't have a problem with popular science books. They're very engaging and accessible, although some of my colleagues would argue otherwise. Um, but this book has been hugely influential, and underlying it is this idea of, of um, how we might nudge people. And what we mean by a nudge is that it's a method of influencing people's behavior by changing the context um, in, in which they act. And... Um, so to count as a nudge, it's got to be something that's easy. Um, and it shouldn't be a mandate, but it should be something that's salient. So for example, if you put a bowl of fruit um, next to uh, someone as they're coming in to decide what they want for their lunch, and it's the first thing they see, um, that could act as a nudge. And they think, perhaps I should have a, an apple rather than that uh, nice dessert over there. Whereas if you ban junk food, that's not a nudge. That is a mandate. So, um, nudging has been, uh, the government got really excited a, f a couple of years ago about uh, n using nudging, and they set up the nudge unit, and I believe someone at UCL was involved in this until they disappeared somewhere else. Um, and what they uh, do is um, they've been advising the government on how to encourage people to change their behavior, and they came up with this white paper called Mindspace, which um, I think is perhaps one of the best white papers I've read. It's a practical guide to how all of the different uh, techniques that you might use to nudge people's behavior. And importantly, the idea is that you're trying to do it without forcing them or banning them to do something or passing regulation. And a couple of weeks ago in the, in the news, there was an article saying that this nudge unit um, uh, has saved the taxpayers since 2010 300 million pounds and the taxpayer absolutely loves stories like that and how has it done that and so the evidence they provide is that uh, what they've done is they've changed the wording um, to uh, um, give a bit more loaded message um, so that it makes people follow uh, the law rather than choosing to ignore it. So they let people know that 9 out of 10 people pay their tax on time and that makes people think well maybe I should pay my tax too if all so many other people are paying it. They'll also, they've also personalised text messages to those with outstanding court fines and saying that everyone else has been paying them. And another one that I actually noticed myself is that they ask people to state, are they still eligible for council tax discounts? So every year, this time of year, about October, you get something through the door and it asks you whether you're still living by yourself or whether you're, um, you know, is there someone else living in your house and so on. So it's making you actually think about it rather than having done it a few years ago and then volunteering that information. Um, so in the white paper, they talk... The, act, the acronym MindSpace is, is, uh, can be spelled out to be messenger incentives, norms, defaults, and so on. And these are the main influences that they discuss um, that can influence behavior. And the messenger um, is, um, suggests that the person who communicates um, uh, the message is hugely influential. So if it was um, Justin Bieber suggesting you pay your taxes, <laughs> you may find that more people might pay them if they know who Justin <coughs> Bieber is. Um, and uh, incentive speaks for itself. I'm not going to go through all of these. I don't have time. But if, for those of you who are interested, I think the, the Mindspace document uh, spells out very clearly um, how these can influence behavior. The two that I want to talk about, which we've been um, investigating in our research, are norms and salience. And norms um, essentially... Uh, refer to um, social norms, uh, how we are strongly influenced by what others do around us. And salience refers to how our attention is drawn to what's salient and relevant to us. So let's just have a look at social norms. Um, I was having a conversation earlier with someone from Swansea, who shall remain nameless, but she says, I'm not sure about norms. I think we need a bigger, deeper theory than that. But I'm going to convince her that norms still have a... a 
a big role to play. So, supposing we want to um, get people to uh, reduce their carbon footprint by uh, reducing their computer usage, what we might do is, at the end of the day, um, give an icon showing you how much uh, time you've been, or how much uh, you've been using your computer, and what the carbon footprint is by just having this summary icon. So, at the end of the day, as I turn my uh, iPhone off, it will show this icon by itself. It doesn't really. Um, I just think, oh, okay. Now, supposing John also um, has one, and by itself, it doesn't really say much. It's just a much bigger footprint. But if instead we were to do this, where that's how much I'm using, and relative to the average, I use very little. I don't use my computer much at all, do I? <laughs> um, whereas John, he's actually using more than the average. And according to social norm theory, what do you think happens? If we get this information, does it nudge us? Does it change our behavior? Sure it does. Um, what would happen is John would reduce his computer usage to be more like the norm, the average, and I would think, hey, I'm not using enough. I could do a bit more Facebook, and uh, I will start doing Twitter, and so on. But, so what you're getting is not just the desired uh, change in behavior with John reducing his, but you're also getting the undesired behavior, which is me increasing mine. And this has been found for a number of behaviors uh, drinking in college students, um, and electricity consumption. And it's called um, the boomerang effect. So it's suggesting that people don't always change their behavior towards the desired goal, but it can go up and down. And so we need to take that into account when we're thinking about um, designing technologies um, based on uh, social norms. The second um, uh, influence that we've been looking at is salience and attention. And this is a video that my colleague John Bird over here um, uh, drew my attention to, and um, I think it, it sums up very nicely this factor. Kia ora, and welcome aboard the series. Oops. Before we take off, we'd like to run you through a few in flight safety exercises. <laughs> Hi, everybody. In the next three minutes, we're going to work hard, work out, and get you fit to fly. First, let's stretch it out and lose that baggage. Stretch it up to the overhead locker or slide it under the seat in front of you. Stretch and slide. Yeah, you're a giraffe. Now it's seatbelt time. When the seatbelt sign comes on, buckle it in. Grab, click, pull. Grab, click, pull. Nice and snug, low across the hips, but not too tight. And to undo your belt, just lift the flap. No stress. Remember, you must follow crew instructions and light a sign. If you're okay, I think you've had enough of that. So <laughs> I wasn't going to subject you to the whole video. It's painful. Um, but you can see how they've gone, you know, the, I don't know how many times you've been on a plane where they say that you really have to pay attention. I know you're a frequent flyer, but you don't because you've seen it all before. But um, this is their way of trying to get your attention again. And I'm sure it worked for one time. But if you saw that video coming up again, I think you'd put your earplugs in. <laughs> so um, just to summarize, uh, norms and salience were influenced by what others um, are doing. For example, how much others use or drink in a week. And we're drawn to what's novel and relevant, so flashing banners and twinkling lights. And so um, us in HCI are thinking about how we might use this as the basis for technological intervention. I can't say the word. Intervention. And this is where we do a bit of magic sometimes, but I'll talk about that later. This is a project where we try to put some of these ideas into practice. And it is um, with this long list of people at the bottom here. Um, we started about a year or two ago. And what we wanted to do was to help um, people with their grocery shopping. And when you've got a de decision to make whether I'll buy this bottle of oil or that bottle of oil, which one would... Uh, which one should I choose? I don't know how many of you uh, look at olive oil, but there are increasingly uh, more and more different varieties of olive oil. And you can see there, there are a huge number. And how do you choose? And why were we bothered with this? Um, well, what we're finding is that increasingly people want to know more about the global consequences of their food shopping. 
and uh, governments and the EU are requiring it as mandate that they uh, put this information on the packaging. And this includes nutritional information, packaging, um, what the allergies are, whether it's vegetarian, how you cook it, what the nutritional content is, and so on and so forth. And what this does is it makes um, the information um, difficult to to kind of read and make informed decisions in situ. So if you imagine you had like 10 different oils and they had all of this on, how do you, you know, decide, um, uh, how can you read all of that? So that was kind of um, motivating our research is that people want to know more about where their food comes from, but they find it hard to get that information whilst shopping in situ. And so what we wanted to do was to think about what kind of technology and what sort of information could we present in situ to make it simpler. So our first idea, or rather my first idea, was to have an ambient shopping trolley. And it was based on this idea of fast and frugal heuristics that people could make a rapid decision and also the social norm. So the idea was that we would have glowing handles that would show the aggregate representation of healthiness relative to some norm, and that could be the family of four or whatever, um, or it could be shoppers in Ho versus shoppers in um, um, Swansea. And uh, the idea you'd see at a glance who were the good shoppers and who were the bad shoppers, and that might change your behavior. However, when I presented this idea to the rest of the team, they looked at me in uh, amazement and said, no, 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 no way. That's too, you know, people, shoppers would never like that. It's too simple, too in your face, and uh, it, um, it wouldn't help people make a, a choice between A and B. So I backed down, as all good researchers should, and we went for um, a more subtle design, which we called the lambent handle. And the word lambent, refers to glowing or gleaming uh, with soft radiance. So our idea was that we would um, have a handle still, um, but it would, be, um, it would use LEDs and we would have information salience where we would show two pieces of product information uh, where these LEDs would light up and then we would use um, a smiley icon based on social norm that could show the contents of the shopping shopper's trolley relative to others. So it wasn't kind of really out there, but it was quite subtle. So just this is what we, we made a number of um, uh, prototypes, and this is what we finished up with. This is um, developed in conjunction with uh, Nick Villa um, and .NET Gadgeteer in um, Microsoft and 3D printing. So everything's in here, and you just put that, clip that onto your trolley, and this bit here, you can see, is the, um, is the smiley icon. It's, uh, it's not too sure what it's doing in this room right now. It's used to being in supermarkets, so forgive it. Um, but anyway, the idea is that you scan your product under here, and it will show two pieces of information. One, um, in the first study we did, it was food miles. We were interested in you know, whether people cared about where their food came from. So if it, if it was in Europe, it would maybe light up four or five, whereas if it was from Japan, it would go all the way along there. And then this would show um, whether you were above or below. And the question would be, how does my weekly shop compare with other shoppers? And if you're doing much better, you'd have that one on the left, and if it's okay, and then on the right, um, not happy at all. So, um, once we designed this and uh, tested it, I then said to Viva and Haled, go and do an in the wild study. We spent ages trying to get permission from Tesco's and Waitrose to um, be able to use this. And they always say, no, go and see so-and-so, go and ask so-and-so. And Haled only had a few more weeks left with us. And so I said, well, how is this different from using a mobile phone with a shopping list on it? So with that, they went off to uh, Asda, actually. And we ran a study in the Wild Supermarket study where we had 18 participants, two conditions, one with the handle and one without. We wanted to see how this influenced their decision making. So we set a scenario where for each condition, participants were given a shopping list. For example, you had green guests coming for the weekend to stay, so you need to think about um, their sensibilities. And just to uh, get cut to the chase, what did we find? You can see here on the right, someone is scanning some butter. Um, and we found that when they were using the lambent display, 
72% of the products selected um, with this had lower food miles. So they were actually using this to see which one um, was lower. And they changed their minds for products when the price was the same. So there we are using the fast and frugal heuristics. So once they got over price, they thought, well, you know, maybe they'll be varied on um, food miles. And they chose products with the fewer LEDs. Products that light up too much make me think twice was one of the quotes. So were people nudged? Yes, um, in our study, considerably. But there were certain things that wouldn't be nudged. Uh, one was their favorite brands. They wouldn't change if they liked a particular chocolate. Even if it had come from um, some exotic country, um, they wouldn't go for one that came from Belgium. And also that for products they disliked, it wouldn't make them change whether to change from Marmite or blue cheese. Um, the smiley icon was also actually uh, surprisingly effective in terms of getting people to think about uh, what was in the um, shopping trolley. So when it was above the norm, participants um, uh, scanned and checked food miles of, of more products. And another quote here was, the smiley face made me happy and the sad face bothered me. And so I think there we were able to show how this um, kind of display can be quite effective in providing salient information and also in, in a kind of playful way, and that it was able to help people to um, decide between products. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't think if you, if you were buying a big weekly shop, uh, 100, 150 items, you would, you would do that for every item. And indeed, we would think that this, um, if it was to be used, you would probably just do it for a few items rather than the whole lot. We also did another study comparing it with a mobile app. Um, are for people's smartphones and found overwhelmingly that this was much more um, preferred and um, useful than the mobile phone apps. But I want to move on now to uh, another, other kinds of behavioral change that we've been looking at. I've already mentioned uh, the studies we've done looking at uh, how you can get people to take the stairs. Um, we've been looking at how you can reduce energy consumption and also how you might improve health and well-being, getting people to uh, take more exercise. Another area that I'm really interested in, and I'll come back to that, is how we can help people concentrate more and how we might help uh, motivate learning using some of these techniques. But I want to move on now to um, the Tidy Street project that some of you might have heard of, because um, I think it's um, you know, uh, what we tried to do here and what we achieved is, is quite um, considerable. And this was run with, by John Bird, and we did it in conjunction with Goldsmith's um, Interaction Research Studio. And again, we were asking, can we use social norms as the basis for a public display um, to try and reduce not just an individual's um, electricity consumption, but a whole community's um, electricity consumption? And so what we did was we... Um, we, tr we selected a street in Brighton, which is where I live, and the street just happened to be called Tidy Street. And when I first went to Sussex, that's where I lived for a few months. And it's a very community-based. This is them having a summer party where they've laid out the artificial turf. And they do this every summer, and they're very much a community. So they bought into this idea of taking part in our study and where they would all... Um, it's a terraced house street where they would all see if they could... Um, reduce their um, energy or electricity consumption. So once again, we thought, how might we use social norms? And then the idea to begin with was, was that um, this was based on a, an art project um, from pre previous years, where an artist had uh, blown up photos from each of the houses um, that meant something to them in their window boxes um, as part of a, an art project. And we thought, well, maybe we could do something similar by showing what the electricity consumption was um, for each household, whether it was above or below um, the average for the street, and would it re would it reduce the um, the street's consumption if it was made public? But again, I got um, told, no, no, this isn't the way to do it. That participants, when we asked them, felt really uncomfortable about publicly displaying their electricity consumption in this way. And what they wanted instead was one that encouraged um, community um, rather than, uh, community building and being part of the community rather than being competitive. And so we thought long and hard, how can we display information to be meaningful? And we had lots of discussions with our colleagues at Goldsmiths and they came up with a very different idea and that got us into a bit of an impasse for a while. But eventually we came up with a design that they were happy with and this was our final design, which was to make the street into a graph. 
and we uh, got a uh, graffiti artist on board and you can see here the average for Brighton goes all the way along for th and each day we plotted uh, what um, what it was for the, uh, the average for the street relative to Brighton and the idea was that they could see whether they were above or below and um, I'm going to show you a video that was made um, of this but just to summarize the techniques we used were to get them to think how does my electricity usage compare to the street average and my city using that street display but they also had individual web graphs and then information salience which is how much electricity am I using Again, we got them to uh, record each day their electricity usage, use appliance meters, and they could look up on website graphs. Um, when we first, um, or rather John, uh, started to uh, um, talk about this project, it went viral. Everyone was really excited by it. And Gary Huswit, who is a filmmaker, documentary maker in New York, flew over specially to film it and he made a, a video called Urbanized of which we uh, feature in it for two minutes so I'll just play that for you We're interested in making people more aware of their patterns of behaviour so that potentially they can change them in this project, we were interested in electricity usage. We actually went for a very low-tech method of recording electricity usage. So rather than using smart sensors, each day we got the participants on Tidy Street to go down to their electricity meter, note down the reading, and then they went to our website and they put that number in. We were interested in doing a public display, so we decided that we would turn the street, essentially, into a big graph. On the street, we show how the average usage of the participants compares to the Brighton average. It's 500 feet long, we record it for three weeks, and each day we show how they compare. So if you're looking down the street, you can see how the electricity usage has changed over time. It's woken us up. I'm not very technological with it, so I did my best, and I try to unplug things and stuff. But it has made us very conscious of what we, you know, what we use, what we waste. It wasn't really so much about the numbers as where your Wigley line was going in relation to the street's Wigley line. Seeing the information correctly really focused you into thinking about things that you leave on that you don't need to. Mine was quite high, so I needed to, in the community spirit, try and get that down rather than bring the street average up and above. Um, so I started changing the way I did things. One other piece of technology that we gave the participants was um, an appliance meter. I think that was really important for them because once they got an idea of how their overall electricity was changing, they then wanted to identify which particular appliances were, were using more electricity. We'd see just how greedy some of the devices we had in the house were. Halogen lighting, very, very greedy. Uh, television, not so bad. The kettle, you know, we have to ration the number of cups of tea we have every day uh, because uh, it uses up so much electricity. But it does make you very aware of what you're using. Everybody walked by, as you can see them examining the street art, trying to understand what it was. There was a lot of conversation that went on in the street. You know, we met some people. We were always talking about the project. When we people were walking down on Saturday, they wanted to talk about the project. <coughs> so I think it generally raised the profile having this thing in the road. Over the first few weeks of the project, the average electricity usage of the participants came down by 15%. So it's promising, and we're hoping that that change will be sustained. I thought about energy usage in general, but I hadn't thought about how I would change my behaviour to do anything about it. By participating in the project, what it did was just made me act on it as opposed to think nice thoughts about perhaps doing something. The main lessons we can learn about sustainability from this project is that although it starts with individuals, a really important factor in people's behaviour is their community. People are influenced by what other people are doing around them. So if you can engage them as a community, they seem to be more motivated and more likely to change their behaviour.
Okay, so our public display, I should point out that it was uh, chalk, so it's eventually washed away, and we never got permission from the council, but we did get permission from someone else, I believe. Anyway, um, it was a, <laughs> acted as a daily reminder of the project, and as John was saying, generated a sense of community pride, and led to lots and lots of interactions with passers-by, and that they became champions of the project. They loved to come out and talk to uh, uh, the passers-by and explain what the project was. And then that was disseminated. So one of the, the, the women who lived in the street, she was a teacher, so she told her school kids, and they told their parents, and the parents told their friends, and so on. So there was that nice um, propagation. But how effective was it? Well, as John said, um, after three weeks, which was the duration, um, that was as long as the street was, um, that um, they all reported an increased awareness of their electricity usage and that we had quite a high uh, reduction, 15%, which compared to other studies is quite impressive. But one of the things that we did was six months later go back and find out was it still the same. And what John found was that 20% of the participants continue to record their electricity uses on a daily basis. And that two of these showed a significant reduction um, uh, over the six months, which is, you know, it was disappointing to begin with, but um, it's much more than be expected from the seasonal changes. But I've had long discussions with John about, you know, should we be too disappointed? But if we look at the diaries and we look at what they talk about, that they've actually changed more subtly their, their behaviours as to what they do. So we may not have that, that bold um, statistic that the government would like us to have to say that it's continued. But I think what we've done is something much more subtle in terms of changing their behaviour. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to just finish off now with some new research that I'm just starting. And this is uh, a couple of projects I'm just starting. One is to think about how we might improve our computer habits. This is one of my colleagues, uh, Nadia, I was in Italy with last week, and I don't think I ever saw her without her iPhone in her hand. She even fell over the curb and uh, <laughs> raised her knees as a consequence. The second one is overcoming fussy eating problems. Um, this is a project called Me Time, which uh, Viva uh, Kaunikaiti has been doing with Steve Whitaker, and she's going to be joining us again. Basically, she's designed an ambient display uh, that logs in real time what you're doing on your computer. And it will show you over an hour uh, what the percentage is, how much time you're using Notepad or Google Chrome, and that whenever you switch from one application to another, a white line will show, so you'll get these spikes going across. And the idea is that you can see at a glance how much switching you're doing. And many of us know that switching between activities too much isn't necessarily the most efficient or productive way of working. And so she's now look, she carried out a study where people were using this, and it's kind of in, some very interesting results are being revealed. Um, but I won't say any more about that, but I want to move on to our project that we're proposing. This is with John and Anna Cox and David Silver and Sebastian Riedel, where we are again thinking about how we can nudge people to be more efficient in managing their work tasks, especially email. And one of our ideas is, again, on this notion of trying to um, reduce the amount of switching that, that people do. So using machine learning techniques, um, our idea is to get people um, to be able to group their emails by activity um, uh, rather than just uh, answering them as they come in uh, chronologically and that the machine learning will help do that. And a lot of people are working in this area to try and crack it but what we're trying to do here is how do we bring the HCI to this is to come up with some novel visualisations. And this is one that John had his idea, which was that, I don't know how many of you use TomToms, but um, it will tell you the expected time of arrival, which I think is 10.19 here. And what you try and do is beat the system and get there earlier. And you may break the speed limit, but you feel an inc incredible sense of achievement if you shave off two or three minutes. And so the idea here is that we would try and s have these sorts of targets for people um, for their email, so that if they get them done a few minutes earlier um, and they finish earlier, they'll get a sense of achievement. But importantly, that time could then be spent on doing those enjoyable tasks that we never have time to do anymore, which is write papers <laughs> <laughs> and read books. So, um, the other project we're just starting, um, 
And this was funded in the, in the summer for an intern project uh, by Beams and Sangeeta Ganesh, who I think is somewhere here, uh, who's an undergraduate in computer science, and my colleague Paul Marshall, and also Kenton O'Hara, who works at Microsoft Research Cambridge. We were looking at how we might use augmented reality in all sorts of ways of uh, uh, um, looking at... Um, uh, augmenting food and we hit upon this idea of fussy children eaters I don't know how many of you remember when you were a child or have children who really <coughs> don't like their greens or their peas and so our idea this was just a very small pilot study uh, was to somehow change what peas look like and so this is just an animation that Sangeeta did in the summer which is to change the colour of peas so they don't look like peas anymore but they look like glowing disco beads. Anyway, um, we, Sangeeta went off and uh, took this animation to one of my colleagues who's got two young boys aged four and six and to see what they made of it, uh, just as an, uh, uh, an initial pilot study. And they really loved it. They were very playful. They, one of them said he really thought that, that the peas tasted differently according to their color, which is great news to us. Um, and so what we're planning to do now is actually build um, a more robust mobile uh, system with uh, Microsoft's Connect Fusion uh, technology and have a more interactive um, um, application and see you know, whether or not this can actually have, um, uh, can nudge children to eat foods which they really don't like by distracting them. So that's um, the other project. So just to, to summarize, um, I've been talking a lot about uh, various technology interventions and what we importantly do is we run our studies in the wild. We go into supermarkets, we get into trouble, we go into uh, fam uh, people's homes because we think that actually behavior is very different in these contexts and will be changed differently. But there are lots of other factors that come into play when you go into the wild. And so can we actually say, are our um, interventions causing the observed changes? And um, you know, that's something that we are working on, thinking about how systematic um, our research is in the wild. Um, a lot of people argue, well, what about the novelty effects, you know? And indeed, there are novelty effects, but we argue, let's play on those. Let's, let's <coughs> capitalize on them then rather than try and avoid them because we're not trying to come up with significant results. We're actually trying to make an impact. And I talked about how the government um, has been trying to get people to abide by the law by changing wording. Maybe that's just that, if that is quite effective. Do we need to be building all of these wacky technologies? And my argument is yes, because we're looking at a whole range of different um, behaviors. Another one is to think about, is it ethical to be sneaky like this? To, um, but we think that you know, if you are designing technologies for behaviors that people care about and want to change, then that is ethical, so long as they buy into it. And with the kids, they knew immediately that it, it, it was coming from up here, and then they started to play with the light on their, on their arms themselves. But it's that suspending of disbelief, which I think is important for that user group. And so, yes, they were, are people being aware that they're being nudged? In our study um, with uh, the twinkly lights, when we asked people in the building had they changed their behavior, they said no, but we actually logged their behavior over several months and discovered that actually there was a significant change in people taking the stairs more than the lifts. And so perhaps they weren't aware in that context, but in others they are. Um, which technology changes are most long-lasting. That's something that we're moving into now, is that, as you saw with the Tidy Street project, um, you know, you can, you know, so long as there's a champion there and people will continue to be motivated, but once people disappear, is it still sustainable? And we're looking into that. And we're also developing new understandings and theories. So I think just to finish off, there are four key challenges for behavioral change. One is this idea of how we increase awareness Another is to motivate change and then to facilitate and finally to sustain it. Um, I'm running out of time, so this is something that myself and Paul have been putting into the bigger picture, uh, which is to think about a, a whole approach to doing research in the wild. And so we're developing this new framework. It's on my um, whiteboard if anyone's interested and wants to come and talk to me about it. But it's in... So my final slide is... Um, 
psychological methods, the ones we've been talking about to do with nudging, like norms and salience, can change behaviour. We've shown that, and technology can nudge, and we think that's very effective. There are whole different ways in which you can do that. And so what we need is this new science of te technological behavioural change to explain how technologies and visualisations work in conjunction with these um, psychological techniques in the world. And on that note, I would just like to thank all my many collaborators who've worked for me over the years at the UCL, Open University, Bath, Indiana, Nottingham, Goldsmith, Sussex, and DFKI. But especially, I'd like to give um, my word of thanks to John Bird, Khaled Makua, who's not here, Paul Marshall, Viva, Stefan, and Johannes, who've worked with me over the years. And um, finally, Swansea University for making me curious. Thank you. of nudging you into not asking questions I will say there is uh, there are some drinks and nibbles up on the fifth floor in the uh, uh, Mallet Place Engineering Building but if there are questions <laughs> very well, I'm sure we're all good guys here we want to use technology to reduce carbon footprints and get us to eat our greens but I would assume that there are people out there who want to use technology to get us to buy more chocolate to buy bigger cars. Are there similar studies being done by manufacturers, by retailers, by others that would use this technology for their ends? The world is a sinister place and we all want to make more money and uh, exploit people and make them feel that they want bigger and better cars. I agree. Uh, and that's where mandates come in, where the governments, you know, particularly somewhere like California, have been very effective at getting people to think that the hybrid car uh, um, is more um, appealing to drive than a big fat uh, boat and so changing people's attitudes and their desires um, is something that um, these, these car companies um, are interested in doing and so I don't think that, that everyone, you know, you know, they, they realise that, that there is a mandate that um, requires them to change eventually and that it's in their interest to do so. So that would be my um, response to that, is I think that um, these you know, people aren't all mean and, and nasty, and they, they can actually make money out of hybrid cars, as an example, and electric cars. whether it's perceptive or not. Um, I think yes. I mean, uh, again, I was having a discussion about this earlier today. And um, what, what those lights did, first of all, su was to surprise people, but then it lured them, and then they got very attached to them. Um, and then they started dancing with them. So the size, I think, really depends on a, how long is a piece of string. Um, you know, it, you know, what's the context? What's the behaviour you're trying to change? How resistant is it to change? That was a simple decision. Although, you know, for some people after lunch they may feel they're feeling a little lazy and they'd rather just take the lift. I think in this building it wouldn't work because. Um, you know, we're on the eighth floor, although sometimes we do have to walk up if the lifts aren't working or they're very busy. Um, so I, I really think it's hard to answer that other than it, you know, it depends on the s length of the string. Uh, 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 we want to talk about the really about the tiny string project. Um, I'm just wondering um, whether um, you thought that that would work similarly in other areas. I mean, I know Brighton is very sort of green, sort of focused area, so is there an element of the sample? Yes, I'm going to ask John Bird to answer that question because he actually was asked to go to Canada, to Bainbridge Island, to, to run the same uh, project there. And what happened? Uh, it didn't work. <laughs> 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 and the, there were a couple of reasons. Um, oh, the, uh, we did it in two streets. It, um, it was in Seattle, actually. Um, uh, in Seattle. We did it in two streets, and they were very different from the Tiny Street one. So Tiny Street is actually very close to City Centre. There's a huge throughput of people. Uh, and that was very important because it mentioned that the well mentioned it gets this championing effect going. People really like telling other people about their display. Whereas the um, in Seattle, one was in a cold big sack in a suburb, which hardly had any football. So we didn't get that that kind of the people going fast. And the other one 
was out in a rural area um, where nobody walks really. <laughs> they were all in cars. Um, so, so it, they are very obvious, um, but we didn't choose the location. So they said they were interested in doing the project, so we gave them the software we developed, and we told them about half of it. But one thing we didn't really appreciate fully was the, how important that particular context is. So I think it would work, but the advice would be to go in quite urban areas where lots of passes by and urban areas. Sorry, there's a question back one of the organisers of the weekend of debates with back of ideas in a couple of weeks' time. I say that part of plug into the panel of the brochure. Several brochures, if anybody wants one. And also, to make a serious point, we've been debating a lot of these uh, topics that we've been brought up around people's lifestyles, around living in community, etc. I was speaking on that particular topic. I just wonder whether there's a problem with reducing these kinds of topics to behaviour change and nudging when debating these this sort of thing, much more healthy yeah. approach. Mm -hmm. um, is there a danger you're shortcutting the debate? Is there something slightly authoritarian about the debate? Certainly not authoritarian. We very much involved the community from the start. They were very excited by it. They, as we saw in the video, you know, they were very much talking about the project throughout. Um, so I don't think it's shortcut. I think this project took a hell of a lot of time to um, to come to fruition. Um, and I think um, there is a debate. And I, uh, in one of my slides, I talked about you know should we do the more top top-down approach of um, having a targets and limits, but also should we maybe have more participation where people um, talk about it. So I think there's a debate to be had. I totally agree with you, but I think we're not doing um, short curves. I think there's something playful about what we're doing with this nudging and that people know very well what they, you know, and they buy into it. Um, and so I don't think there's anything sinister or shortcut about it. And if it works and we're, you know, able to show an impact, um, then why not? Hi, Ron. Hi. Um, just wondered, thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any opinions or evidence of how this might work in different cultures? So, for instance, Anglo Saxon culture versus the Chinese, in terms of, as an example of how that might be more effective? Or is it the same all around? Um, I don't know because we've only done our studies here in, in, in the UK, but um, I'm, I'm sure that there would be cultural differences, yeah. The reason I ask is because you know, there, there is a notion that the Anglo Saxon culture is fairly resistant to kind of you know, having this kind of um, nudge thrust upon them as opposed to maybe not. So I just wondered if it's. I don't know, I'd like to think of Britain as being multicultural, um, uh, particularly Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> Last one? Last question. Um, I'd like to ask if, would you think this project uh, would have worked in a big city like London, in a big street? Um, I think uh, Oxford Street isn't is very different from Tidy Street on many counts, and it's where tourists go to shop. So they don't really have any control, and the the I mean, whether you want to you know like Gap and all of those shops to reduce their electricity is is a difficult question, and I think that's where a good debate could be had. You know, do, should they keep their doors open uh, in the you know, middle mid of winter to try and lure and attract people in? Is there another way in which they can get people to come into their shops without all of that heat going out? Um, so in terms of having, uh, I think it could be fun for them to see that uh, this street in London is using less electricity than uh, a similar street in New York. So yes, I think you could do it on that scale, but I think you need to think of it very differently. Okay, I think we'll draw to a close there and uh, we can thank uh, one again. Uh, and just to say you're all invited back to the fifth floor of the Planet Project Studio if you would like to have a break and a discussion over.